Yeah, it's almost here, right? Some of you are so excited. You're going to hang out with your family for a couple weeks. You say, Pastor, that's why I'm at church today. I need Jesus, okay? I'm so glad that you're here. I want to welcome both of our campuses, LaGrange and Noon, and I'm so glad that you've chosen to be here on this day. It's a very, very awesome day. I want to take just a second, and I want to brag on you, okay? I know you just saw that video, and sometimes we, uh, we, we do our best to always connect the dots of how your generosity changes people's lives. Yesterday, here at our Noonan campus, we participated in Christmas in Coweta, which is a phenomenal thing that happens in our community. Lots of churches do this all over our area. But yesterday, um, as a church, you gave generously over 175 kids got Christmas because of your generosity. And uh, 70 families, I believe, were helped. I just think we ought to celebrate that. And uh, I want to say this, I'm excited. Wednesday night, I'm going to be with our LaGrange campus. They do the same thing this coming Wednesday, a program down there called Southcrest Gives, and we're helping over 60 to 70 families, like actually 20-something families, 60 to 70 children will get Christmas just because of our campus down there in LaGrange. And so, man, I'm just praising God for that. That's over 225 kids that get an opportunity to have Christmas. That is the spirit of this church, and that's the heart of this church. And let me say this, if you're new to Southcrest and you say, man, what is this whole thing about? Like, you guys are weird. You meet in a warehouse, right? And people are excited about this. And I see the signs every weekend down on the streets. And that's what our church is about. It's about loving and changing and reaching South Atlanta one relationship at a time. And I'm so glad that you're here, man. This is going to be a great series. So we're in this series called Do You See What I See? And real quickly, because your neighbor may be getting tired beside you, because you know how we get to that slump, the closer you get to Christmas, people get more and more tired. You just need to wake people up a little bit. I want you to do this real quick and look at the person beside you, okay? Just say, I see, do you see, okay? All right? I'm watching you, right? And so um, that'll wake your neighbor up, because it's weird when someone does that to you, Okay. So we're in this series called, Do You See What I See? Last week I shared that we're launching a 100 day campaign. And over the next couple of weeks, we're gonna be talking a lot about Christmas, but we're gonna be talking a lot about our faith, about how God doesn't want us to stop short of seeing what he sees. And we said last week that if we could see as God sees, then we would give as God gives, but then it has a refractive ability that then when we give as God gives, we start seeing the world the way God wants us to see it. And so as we launch into to week two today, I want to tell you that uh, God wants you to see more. Like sometimes we only see what we see, and it becomes so focused on our vision that we don't always see God's vision for our life, right? I mean, think about it. When God sent his son Jesus in a manger, the world saw a star, and they saw a baby without a home. And, and, and a lot of people, they keep Jesus in that manger, but God saw more. God saw humanity. He saw this world that was so messed up and broken by sin, and God saw more. And I think because God saw more, God wants us to see more in our life as well. So today, as, as we start, I have a, have a huge confession to make, okay? And if this blows your idea of who you thought I was, then um, it wasn't very big in the first place. Um, I don't always enjoy decorating for Christmas. Anybody here like that? <laughs> yeah, amen, brother. Like, I knew you were real. Like, you know, the, the truth is this. I don't always enjoy it. In fact, I, I know some of you go, yeah, I, Sean, I expect that you're the type of guy that on the 23rd of November, you, you run to Tracy and you say, honey, when are we going to get out of the Christmas stuff? Like, I am dying to decorate trees. Like, I've thought about them all night long. I've even thought about how we would decorate the mantle differently this year from last year. I don't think that way. And then I don't wake up and go, oh, honey, how many days till we can spend half a day in the yard climbing through things to put things on our house that we never see because we stay inside all the time, right? <laughs> but our neighbors see, right? And we want to one-up our neighbors and we don't want, you know, we're pulling out going, he's not as good as mine. And the, the truth is this, I don't always enjoy decorating for Christmas. And so some of you go, I knew he was bad, okay? It doesn't make me a bad person. It makes me an honest person today. But let me say this, even though I don't always enjoy decorating for Christmas, I love it when Christmas is done and you get to enjoy all that it represents. 
So sometimes in our house, we will literally just turn out all the lights, especially in the mornings. We don't turn on a whole lights in our house and, and, and we will just turn on all the Christmas lights and it just kind of glows throughout the house. And I think, wow, like, like that's just an awesome thing. But, but I still think in my heart, sometimes when it comes to Christmas, I'm stopping short. Have you ever stopped short on Christmas decorations? Some of you know what I'm talking about because some people stop short and some people kind of go over. Like, look at this guy real quick. He kind of went overboard, (laughs) right? Like if you're living next to this person, you've already contacted your HOA. (laughs) And you're saying, listen, I pay lots of money to keep this person away from my house, right? But then sometimes we stop short. So your wife says, hey, have you put the outside lights up yet? And you say, of course I have, honey. (laughs) Of course, I, I put them... To where everybody can see them, and I'm sure that all those bulbs work, right? Oh my gosh, I just wanna say this. Someday, somebody will create a string of lights that all the lights work. Like in heaven, all the lights will work. (laughs) But in hell, none of the lights will work. And that's why you don't wanna go there, okay? Look at this next one. Hey, I didn't have enough wrapping paper, and I needed to get this gift wrap done, so I kinda stopped short and just found something laying around, because this is how a guy thinks. Hey, I got it done. Mission accomplished, right? So, yeah. So, look, someone goes, that's my gift. This, that one's intriguing to me. <laughs> yeah, some of you men go, that is a great idea. We, my wife doesn't need as much wrapping paper as she says she does, all right? So, look at this next one real quick. Hey, honey, I've got some extra spare computer parts, and we're just going to make a Christmas tree. That is weird, okay? The Geek Squad would even say that's weird, okay? What about this one? You're heading over to grandma's house, you forget to wrap it, and all of a sudden your mom or your wife calls you and says, hey, did you wrap grandma's gift? Ah, suddenly you pull your children's notebooks out from school and you wrap it, because here's the thing, grandma can't see very well anyway, right? (laughs) So she's gonna open that up and she, oh, you guys thought of me. Oh yeah, we thought of you. And then there's that one. Mom, I got you a gift on the way over. I even decorated it for you. Yeah, and then look at this one. This one's crazy right here. Close enough. Just close enough. So here's the thing, okay? We do this a lot in our life. In our life, we have a tendency to stop short. Sometimes we can stop short in our relationships. Like sometimes in our marriage, we say, you know, I'm just gonna give to this point, but but I'm really not gonna press and and go all the way in my relationship with my spouse. I'm just gonna kind of go halfway. We do it a lot sometimes in our parenting with our children. We're like, you know, my kids are good enough. Like, you know, the police haven't come to our house lately. Things are pretty good. Um, and we just kind of stop short a lot, right, in our, in our parenting sometimes. Sometimes we do it in our jobs. Like, I don't know, maybe you work with some people, but their job is just to do the, the least amount possible to keep themselves from getting fired and having a job three weeks from now. We stop short in our career. Sometimes we do it in our finances. We say, you know what? I know God wants me to give. I know God wants me to be generous, but I'm just gonna kinda, I'm just gonna kinda chuck a buck, you know? I'm just gonna kinda do the, the bare minimum maybe that I can get by in my life. But here's what I've realized about stopping short. When it comes to believing God, sometimes it's easy to stop short. Sometimes it's easy. And why is that? Because sometimes we don't always see what God sees. And that's why we're in this series because our job, our heart is we wanna see what God sees. And when it comes to believing God, it's easy to stop short because we always say, well, if I could just have his perspective, if I could just know what he knows, but the truth is God wants us to trust him whether or not we fully understand him or not. The truth is if you can fully understand all that God is doing, he's probably not God. He would be you. And I don't know, I don't always trust myself. And so when it comes to believing God, we often stop short. I'm reading this book right now by a guy named Mark Batterson. The book's called Chase the Lion. And he says this in his book about just breaking even and stopping short in our life. He says, there's a brand of religiosity that seems satisfied with breaking even. Don't do this, don't do that, and you'll be okay. The problem with this is you can do nothing wrong and still do nothing right. And I thought, man, that's so true about our lives, right? 
We can do just the bare minimum to get us to the place that we feel good about ourselves. And really, that's kind of the spoils of religion and spirituality, that I do just enough that I feel good about my relationship with God. But if I get too close to God, he may ask me to do something crazy. And the truth is, that's why it's easy sometimes in our belief to stop short, even when it comes to God. If you have your Bible, I want you to take it to the book of 2 Corinthians, 2 Kings chapter 13. We're going to be in the Old Testament today, 2 Kings 13. In the Bible, there was uh, some prophets uh, that actually went and would speak to many of the kings. Many of the kings were bad, but some of the kings were good. But one of the prophets was a prophet by the name of Elisha. Elisha uh, was the guy who came after Elijah. Remember Elijah, the guy who called down fire from heaven on the prophets of Baal? Well, Elisha said, I want a double portion of what Elijah had. And we know according to the history and the records that in 2 Kings 13, Elisha had gone through a period where he wasn't speaking a lot for the Lord. In other words, God's people were probably kind of so far away from God that God just said, hey, I'm gonna let them kind of come to their senses a little bit and realize you know, that I'm God, that they need me. But every now and then the Lord would tell the prophet, I want you to go tell these people this. Well, we know from the records that it had been almost 40 years. In fact, it was later in Elisha's life when we catch him here in the story. But in this moment, the prophet Elisha comes to a king and he says something to him that helps us understand why God wants us to go all the way in our life and why he doesn't want us to stop short. Look what it says in 2 Kings 13, 10. It says, in the 37th year of Joash, king of Judah, Jehoash, son of Jehoaz, became king of Israel in Samaria and he reigned 16 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam, sons of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. He continued in them. What were the sins of Jeroboam? Jeroboam was one of the kings that was evil. There was Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Jeroboam, here was his sin. Hey, I know God's people well enough. They will fall in love with another leader if I don't make easier ways for them to fall in love with me. So he did what a lot of us would do. Everyone knew that in those days to worship God, you had to go to Jerusalem. Jeroboam came in and said, hey, I'm gonna make it really convenient for you. I'm gonna set up these places of worship outside of Jerusalem that I'm gonna set up and I'm gonna say, hey, you don't need to go to Jerusalem anymore to worship. You can just stay here and worship in Dan and Bethel. And he created places of convenience. But why did he do it? Because he was afraid of man. He was afraid of others. So the Bible says Jehoash continued in that same cycle of fear of man. The idea that if I truly go after God, if I truly follow God, that other people probably won't like me. And look what happens here. Jehoash rested with his ancestors and Jeroboam II succeeded him on the throne. Jehoash was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. Now, many times, and when you read kings, they give the obituary, but before they give the obituary the person, they tell you what they did. Here, it's reversed. We actually read the guy's obituary before we read actually what he did. And I started thinking about that. Isn't that, isn't that funny? Isn't that very telling sometimes about our life that sometimes we actually die before we really ever live? And in this moment, he's basically telling us, hey, this is what happened to him. But then he gives us the story behind his life. Look at verse 14. Now, Elisha had been suffering from the illness from which he died. And Jehoash, king of Israel, went down to see him and wept over him. My father, my father, he cried. The chariots and horsemen of Israel. Why is he saying this to Elisha? Here's why. He's afraid that somebody's gonna come in and take his territory as king and that Jehoash is gonna lose all of his kingdom. And so what does he do? He says, I gotta call the prophet of God, right? Kind of like what we do sometimes. We start getting afraid about our life and what do we do? I gotta start praying. I gotta go to church. I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta do something to help someone else so God and I can be on good terms, right? We kinda try to work our way back into that moment. Here's what he does. He calls Elisha and he starts crying over him and he says, listen, the, the, the horses and the chariots of Israel. And then Elisha does something really unique. Look what it says in verse 15. Elisha said, get a bow and take some arrows. And he did so. Take the bow in your hands, he said to the king of Israel. And when he had taken it, 
Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. So I want you to get the picture. Like he says, hey, Jehoash, I want you to pick up this bow and I want you to put this arrow. And then all of a sudden the prophet comes and he lays his hands on his hands. What does that symbolize? He symbolizes that I'm about to put all of God's power all over you. If you will just trust me, if you will do exactly what I tell you to do, you won't be defeated. You won't have to live in fear. You won't have to worry about all these armies that could come against you. And so he puts his hand as a signal of saying, God's got you, Jehoash, just trust him. But look what happens. Open the east window, he said, and he opened it. Shoot, Elisha said, and he shot. The Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Aram, Elisha declared, you will completely destroy. I always struggle saying this word. Arameans at Ephek. Here's what he says. Open that window, shoot the bow, shoot the arrow, and it's a signal to you of my promise that I will make good. You see, sometimes God gives us a promise, but he's waiting on one thing for it to come about. You know what he's waiting for? Us to act on it. Imagine that moment that Jehoash was like, wow, this guy really is old and he really is sick. He's wanting me to shoot arrows in the air. But he says to him, he says, I want you to shoot that arrow in the air. And when he had taken it, Elisha put his hands on it and he shoots it in the air and he says, this is God's promise. You don't have to fear your enemies anymore. Listen, whatever God promises us in our life, he always provides. You say, well, I don't like the timing and how he provides. Well, listen, his timing's so much better than your timing. I mean, some of us, we have a hard time getting down to the Walmart and getting back in 15 minutes, right? We think we got our timing. God says, no, no, no. When I promise you something, it's going to happen. And he says in this moment, he said, you will defeat all of these people. All you have to do is trust me. But Elisha didn't stop there. What it says in verse 18. Then he said, take the arrows. And the king took them. Elisha told him, strike the ground. And he struck it three times and he stopped. Everybody say stopped. Stop. He stopped. He just quit. So get this, okay? Get this moment. He says, take this, shoot it. It's proof that I'm gonna give you victory. And then he says, now I want you to take the rest of your arrows and I want you to start shooting at the ground with that bow. But the Bible says that Jehoash did three times and he stopped. He stopped. Why did he stop? Because it didn't make sense to him. Why did it stop? Because he was giving evidence of what he believed versus what he was trusting God for. Why did he stop? Because he, he only saw what he saw. But Elisha was trying to get him past himself into a place of crazy faith. See, God wanted more than Jehoash's obedient action. He wanted to move him to the realm of faith where he says, God, I trust you whether or not I understand you or not. I trust you. God always sees the bigger picture, always. He always sees the bigger picture. Look what happens. Verse 19, the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it, but now you will defeat it only three times. He stopped short. God was gonna give him all the victory he could handle, but he could only handle what he could see. And so he shot three and he's done. He stopped short. I started thinking about that in my life. I said, Lord, imagine all the things in my life I may never experience because I stopped short. Imagine all the blessings I will never experience because I stopped short. Here's the truth today. When it comes to God opportunities, don't stop short. Don't stop short. When God puts an opportunity, by the way, an opportunity that God puts before you is really a test to say, do you believe me? 
Are you willing to trust me? See, that's why I'm so excited about our campaign that we're doing, because it's really not about raising the dollars to, to move the mission forward. It's bigger than that. It's the idea of saying, do you see what I see? Are you willing to trust me to the place that I can do something big? Because when God gives you a God opportunity, don't stop short. Here's what's crazy in this moment when you read this passage. Jehoash received all that he believed God for. That's good and that's bad. He never received all that God intended for him. One shot, Jehoash, I'm gonna give you victory. He tells him, I'm giving you victory over these people. And then he says, now I want you to just start shooting arrows at the ground and he shoots three times and then he stops. started thinking about that in my own life. How many times, Lord, have I not trusted you and I've stopped it short and I never stepped into all that you've intended for me in my life. I mean, he missed the meaning of the promise and he missed the fullness of the blessing because he stopped short. I mean, think about it. Don't we live in a stop short culture? I mean, everyone's gonna get a trophy, right? As long as you show up. Some of you go, I hate that. But the truth is, God says, I've given you a quiver called your life and I want you to take every arrow you have and I don't want you to stop short. You just keep firing. I don't know about you, I, 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 wanna, I, wanna, I wanna use it all up. I don't wanna die thinking, man, I still had something in the tank that I didn't give. That somehow someone's gonna say, wow, he could have done so much more for God's kingdom. Don't stop Sure, Here, here's what I've learned. Never trade what is heavenly possible for what is only humanly probable. You see, that's what happened to Jehoash. He didn't even understand the meaning of the promise and so when God told him to do it or when Elisha told him to do it, he basically just kind of said, this is what I can do. This is what is humanly probable for me. I could probably shoot that ground three times. But he never experienced what is heavenly possible because he only focused on what is humanly probable. I mean, we do it all the time, don't we? God says, hey, trust me, trust me. That's the problem, really, when you think about it with religion, is that we say, God, here's my best. Now, I want you to come and bless it. And God says, I don't even need your best. I want you to have my best. And we settle for our best with a little bit of God's blessing when God says, no, I want, you to, I want to bless you with my best. And God says, I just want you to empty the arrows. I want you to empty the quiver. I want you to trust me. I want you to move past halfway. I want you to go all in. See, here's what I know about God. God will make himself known when we step into the unknown. Right? I mean, God will make himself known when we step into the unknown. Imagine Mary finding that she was gonna be pregnant and God saying, you are highly favored. And she said, I don't feel highly favored. I feel completely judged in this moment. Imagine Joseph. Joseph wanted to run, but he stayed. And they trusted God. And they stepped in, and God made himself known when we step into the unknown. That's what happens in our life over and over and over again. Let me tell you why this is so encouraging to me today. Here's why this is so encouraging to me today. God has more in store for us. God has more in store for you and I. You say, prove that. Like, okay, I hear this story. Like, that's a really cool Bible story. Like, I'm gonna tell that to my kids the next time they clean their room the halfway. Hey, don't stop halfway, kids. But how do you and I really walk this out? I mean, think about it. God has more in store for us. And we don't always see what he sees, and so we do this a lot. We get into the cycle of stopping short. I wanna to prove to you God has more in store for us. Look at this passage. This is Paul speaking to the church at Ephesus. He says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all. I want everyone to say that with me, both campuses. Immeasurably more than all. We can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. So I just wanna show you this real quick. This is proof that God has more in store for us. 
Paul is talking to the church at Ephesus, and he's trying to get them to understand the depth and width and breadth of the love of God, to know their identity in Christ. And, and he says, once you know your identity, then I want you to understand God's ability. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all. Think of all the things in your life you can measure. You can measure your finances, you can measure the speed of a car. You can measure your ACT score. You can measure your neighbor's annoyance level, right? You can do a lot of things. to. Me you can even try to measure a, a political debate. I don't know how they quite do that. He won, she won. I don't know. But Paul uses this phrase one time in Scripture. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably, you can't measure it. It's immeasurable. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all. Now that's a crazy statement. You can't even measure it, and then immeasurably more than all. All than what? All that we can ask or imagine. So I'm gonna date myself here, but I want you to understand why this is like, just blows me away, okay? When I was in seventh grade, I had this, math teacher. He walked in with this other seventh grade student that didn't even go to our school. The kid's parents were probably uber rich, right? He walks in and he has this huge, it looks like a brick piece of plastic and he opens it up and he hits a button and this computer screen comes on and all of us seventh graders are sitting in this math class going, and the teacher says this, students, this is called a laptop computer. We went, oh, The teacher looks at us and he says something crazy and audacious. He says, one day, every one of you will own one of these. <gasps> I can't even imagine. All I had was a Texas Instruments calculator, right? That the battery went out every year right before the math exam. Don't know how that happened. But he says, this computer, one day, every one of you. Listen, I couldn't even imagine. My brain was like, poof. Then I remember a few years later, I remember one of my friends said, hey man, one day you're gonna be able to look at someone in a device and talk to them like they did on Star Trek. <laughs> Liar. <laughs> Steve Jobs stand up in front of the world and says, we're introducing a new piece of technology called FaceTime. And suddenly you're talking with people all over the world on a face-to-face -face deal and, and your mind just goes, See, here's what's crazy. Isn't it crazy all the things that we believe about our world, but we don't ever believe about God? He says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or even what? Imagine. Now, some of you have children, right? Raise your hand. They're asking for some audacious things. Listen, some of your kids are gonna go, Dad, I really want a unicorn. And you're either gonna, you're gonna flip out, right? You're gonna have to have a conversation. Well, there's no unicorns, okay? It's just gonna be hard for you, but here's the deal. Kids ask for it. Here's what he says. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to what? According to his power, not your power, his power. And then he says, that is at work within us. You know what I love about this passage? It's complete proof that God wants more for us and we are not to stop short. Here's why. It's evidence of God's power, but with one stipulation. God is able to do all this. Go back real quick. God is able to do all of this, but it's according to this, his power that's worked within us. Look at this. Go to that next slide if you would. God will only do as much for us as we will allow him to do in us. Don't stop halfway. God will only do as much for us as we will allow him to do in us. Listen, folks, this isn't in about just building buildings and expansion. This is about what are we gonna let God do in us? Because God cares more about the process even than he does about the destination. I know what I want you to become, not just what I want you to experience. God will only do as much for us as we will allow him to do in us. Isn't that crazy? He talks about that power. It's the same power that saved us, 
the same power that delivered us from sin, the same power that protects us from temptation and trial and circumstances in our lives. It's that same power that he says, if you will let me do this in you, it will change your life. I was reading a book this summer. It's a great book. It's by a guy named Todd Henry called Die Empty. And if you're a business leader, it's a great book because it talks about doing your best work now, about how you've been created and put here to do something unique and special now, like die empty. Don't die thinking, man, I had more I could have given. And and Todd Henry says these words. He says, knowing that you're going to die is the best way to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. Because we go halfway for this reason. Well, man, what if I lose? What if I fail? What if I don't make it? And God's up there going, no, 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 you don't understand. I've always wanted more for you. Listen, Southcrest, I wanna tell you as our church, God wants more for us. God wants more for us. You go, I don't know that I believe that. Like, Sean, I'm, I'm just really sassy happy right now. Like, like, my life's good. Like, I can come in here on Sunday and check the box. And, and, but guys, listen, South Atlanta needs Jesus, and God wants more for us. He wants us to capture this region with the love of Jesus Christ and take the gospel all over this place. God wants more for us. And let me say this, he didn't send his son and all of himself and wrap him in a little manger so that we could sit here and say, I went halfway. I just went halfway. I wanna show you a picture real quick. Some of you know this mountain, maybe you've never seen it before. This is Mont Blanc. It's one of the tallest peaks, 15,774 feet in the French Alps. It sits right on the Italian border And many people make an excursion to wanna climb the top of this mountain. Halfway up the mountain, there's a place where you can stop to warm your feet, get a nice meal, relax for a little bit, sit back, kind of catch your breath before you do the last ascent up to the peak and up to the summit of Mont Blanc. The name of that inn, because it's French, is called the Inn of Mediocre. You see, the word mediocre in French means halfway. So why wouldn't they name a place that says, hey, you're halfway there? But here's what they say. Of all the people that climb the mountain and try to go to the summit, over 80% of them, when they get to the end of mediocre, they get out, they get themselves warm, they get a nice meal, they warm their feet, they get comfortable, and they look at the summit, and here's what they say hey, maybe somebody else will do that. And 80% turn around and never go all the way. Started thinking about that. God sent his son Jesus and Jesus never stopped halfway. From the time he was born in a manger to the time that he went to the cross, He didn't go halfway. What if Jesus in John 3 would have performed the miracle at the wedding in Cana and he would have said, hey, I've turned water into wine. I'm done. I've done my part. But he just kept going. When they throwed insults at him, he just kept going. Like I have stood at the place when when Jesus left the garden of Gethsemane, he walks toward Jerusalem and he looked over Jerusalem and the Bible says he wept because he saw Jerusalem and he cried because he knew he was gonna give his life. Why? He was gonna go all the way. Jesus never stopped halfway. And I wanna say this, because Christ came out of the grave, you and I don't have to stop halfway either. In fact, I wanna say this, the most powerful thing that's alive in us is the grace of Jesus Christ in our hearts and it enables us to never have to stop halfway in our life because by faith, we can trust him. So you may be here today and you say, Pastor Sean, man, I'm, I get it, you know, don't stop halfway. Listen, some of us are making a life out of halfway. And God says, I got more in store for you. If you're here today, you've never given your life to Jesus. You know what God has in store for you, salvation, forgiveness of sin, to be set free from yourself. But he's waiting for you. He's waiting for you. Let's pray together.